Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we are taking another look at the Second International. We've already had uh, Roger Silverman discussing the foundation, the composition, and how it broke up or imploded um, really in 1912 uh, with the onset of World War I, for sure. Um, tonight, we're taking a closer look our, at the debates within uh, the Second International, and we're very pleased to have with us Mike Tabor, who is an expert on the Second International, also on the Third International. He's a so socialist, an author, and historian, and has written a number of books on, on both those internationals. We're very pleased to have him with us tonight. Thank you very much, Mike, for joining us. He's going to make an introduction of about 35 to 45 minutes. And then as always, we are opening up for questions from the floor. Please go to reactions and choose hand up or raise, raise hand, I think it's called. Uh, thank you, Mike, for joining us. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of Why Marks. Um, I hope my presentation this evening can be a useful follow-up to the discussion you had a couple of weeks ago on the subject. I'll focus on the Second International as a battleground of trends and competing political perspectives. In other words, as a living movement, as all living movements are to some extent. This way of looking at the Second International is a bit different from a common narrative within the revolutionary left, a narrative I myself once accepted, which largely dismisses its legacy. When I first entered the Marxist movement, I had absolutely no interest in studying the Second International. Why should I? As I saw it, this was an outfit that had betrayed the working class, that had supported the bourgeoisie in World War I, that was responsible for the murder of Luxembourg and Liebknecht, that had committed untold other betrayals. So why in the world would I want to spend my time studying it? I certainly was not alone in this attitude. Most revolutionary socialists and communists have tended to view the pre-war Second International as deeply flawed from the outset. Its lessons have generally been seen as primarily negative ones. Over the last decades, few people have spent much time seriously examining it, at least until fairly recent, recently. What's the reason for this lack of interest? One obvious answer is that the social democratic parties of the post-1919 Second International were not interested in doing so, and for good reason. Following the First World War and continuing over the next century, social democratic parties headed the government in many countries, as you and Britain well know. They all defended capitalist rule, both as parties in power and as loyal oppositions. And they were willing participants and or accomplices in numerous colonial and imperialist wars. It's therefore fairly obvious why these parties would not want to be reminded of their revolutionary past. They would prefer to keep that chapter dead and buried. But what about revolutionary socialists and communists? Shouldn't we at least be interested in the resolutions and debates of the Second International during its Marxist period? The reality, however, is that most Marxists today have a conflicted view of the Second International's legacy. The roots of this are not hard to see. In the years immediately after the formation of the Communist International in 1919, Many left-wing socialists wavered on whether to seek to rebuild the Second International or to construct an entirely new world movement. To these wavering elements, supporters of the communist movement repeatedly stressed the Second International's betrayal during the war and the need for a definitive break with it. Emphasis was placed on the necessity of turning one's back entirely on what had become a bankrupt organization that stood in the way of struggles by the working class. Ever since then, generations of socialist activists have felt there was little value in giving much attention to the work of the Second International. While understandable, this view is nevertheless unfortunate for two reasons. First, it means cutting oneself off from an important chapter in the revolutionary movement's history and its lessons. 
And secondly, doing so means ceding that legacy to currents that don't deserve it, those that have sullied socialism's banner for over a century. But I'm convinced that the best of this legacy legitimately belongs to revolutionary socialists and communists. The book Under the Socialist Banner that I edited collects together for the first time in English all the resolutions adopted by Congresses of the Second International between 1889 and 1912. I mentioned at the beginning the attitude I originally had about the Second International. While my views have since changed in working on this book, I nevertheless learned some new things that heightened even more my appreciation of the Second International's legacy. I'll point out three of these that are particularly relevant to our discussion today. First is the role of Frederick Engels, something that's rarely talked about. Engels played a central role in the Second International's founding in 1889, advising the organizers in detail on virtually all questions related to the political preparation of its founding Congress, along with helping to publicize the event. Engels subsequently fulfilled an important advisory role in the Second International for the next six years, all the way up to his death in 1895. During this entire time, he was in essence a guardian of its revolutionary character. And any substantial criticism of the Second International in its early years is by extension, a criticism of Engels himself to some extent. The second thing I became convinced of is the unambiguous revolutionary nature of the Second International's adopted resolutions, with only a few exceptions. The Second International of these years, as expressed in these resolutions, was an irreconcilable revolutionary opponent of the capitalist system. While it championed the fight for reforms in the interests of working people, the eight-hour day, state-sponsored insurance and pensions, public education, votes for women, the right to asylum, and many other reform measures, it rejected the idea that capitalism as a system was reformable. It called for the working class to take political power and expropriate the capitalist owners of the major industries. It insisted that the working class itself was the agent of its own emancipation and it defended the interests of all the oppressed and exploited around the world. The third thing that struck me was when I really examined the actual stance of Lenin and Luxembourg toward the Second International. After 1914, of course, these two were not sparing in invectives to describe the stinking corpse that the Second International had become. In making these political attacks, however, Lenin and Luxembourg never renounced the, res the resolutions the Second International had adopted. Quite the contrary. During the years of the First World War, for example, they would refer to the best of these resolutions, particularly the resolutions on militarism and war, to illustrate the extent to which the Second International's majority leaders were violating these resolutions in practice. What Lenin and Luxembourg criticized, above all, was the Second International's gap between word and deed, its hypocrisy. Additionally, prior to 1914, Lenin, Luxembourg, and other left-wing figures never called for a split in or from the Second International. And even though they each recognized the growth of opportunism within the International, perhaps in slightly different ways, neither of them advocated the expulsion of the opportunists and reformists. The Second International's unity remained unchallenged throughout this whole period. One reason for this was that the Second International of the pre-war period was not just an international organization of socialists. It was also seen as a sort of world parliament of the working class movement. Maintaining the existence of this united body was considered by almost all socialists at the time as virtually a matter of principle. I mentioned at the outset that the Second International was the scene of conflict and debate. 
That's the subject of a new book I've edited, a companion volume to my collection of Second International Resolutions. The new book is titled Reform, Revolution, and Opportunism, Debates in the Second International, 1900 to 1910, be published in September by Haymarket. The Second International's resolutions alone tell one side of the story, but only one side. This new volume helps round out the picture by illustrating the trends, dynamics, contradictions, and competing perspectives within the Second International. It's my hope that these two books taken together can facilitate an accurate assessment of the Second International and its legacy. The book includes excerpts from five oral debates that took place at international congresses, and I'll briefly review each one. The first debate in the book is over Millerandism or ministerialism, that is the question of socialist participation in bourgeois governments. Alexandra Millerand had been a member of the independent socialist group in the French parliament. In June 1899, he accepted a position in the capitalist government of France as Minister of Commerce. The controversy over this in the working class movement came on the heels of the debate over Edward Bernstein's revisionist perspective that broke out the same year. These two challenges by Bernstein and Milleron were often lumped together by revolutionary Marxists at the time. The question of ministerialism was debated at the Second International's Congresses of 1900 and 1904. At the 1900 Congress, a resolution was presented by Karl Kautsky that condemned socialist participation in capitalist governments in general. But in an attempt at a compromise, he did so under so-called normal circumstances, leaving the door open to, quote, exceptional ones. After a lengthy debate, Kautsky's compromise resolution was adopted by a vote of 29 in favor to nine votes for a counter resolution that opposed socialist participation in capitalist governments under all circumstances. But Kautsky's compromise was unsatisfactory to almost everyone, and consequently the debate came up again at the next International Congress in 1904. This time, the main resolution was based on one adopted by the SPD in Germany that unambiguously condemned socialist participation in capitalist governments, with no exceptions. That resolution had been drafted by Kautsky and August Babel. At the 1904 Congress, the Kautsky-Babel resolution was opposed by an ambiguous one reminiscent of the Kautsky resolution four years earlier put forward this time by Victor Adler and Emil van der Veld. The highlight of the debate was a verbal exchange between Babel and Jean Jaurès of France, which clearly outlined the competing perspectives of reform versus revolution as a strategic goal. There were also important contributions in the debate from Rosa Luxemburg, Christian Rakowski, Plekhanov, and other well-known Marxists as well as some who became notorious opportunists. At the conclusion of the debate, which took up most of the Congress sessions, the, res the resolution originating from the SPD was adopted, but half the delegates nevertheless supported the ambiguous resolution. Of interest is that very few delegates openly defended Millerand in the debates, really only Jarre. Most supporters of the 1900 Kautsky resolution and the 1904 Adler Vanderveld resolutions stated that they themselves condemned Millerandism, but that the question of whether to accept a ministerial post should be a tactical decision to be made by each party. And they, and they also stated that they didn't want the inter, international congresses to issue condemnations of any sort. In other words, this, it was an adaptation to the reformists and opportunists. The second debate taken up in the book is on colonialism, which took place at the 1904 and 1907 Congresses. At that time, an important section of the Second International began to question the movement's established anti-colonial stance. Among the main spokespersons for this position were Eduard Bernstein and Hendrik van Kohl of the Netherlands. 
they and others began to present a pro-colonialist perspective, which came to be termed as socialist colonialism. The idea being that socialism too would require colonies. And they defended the view being spread by capitalist spokespeople as to colonialism's supposed civilizing mission and the necessity of colonies in order to meet the needs of modern industry. They also stated that they didn't want to simply issue negative criticisms of the crimes of colonialism, but to propose a positive program for colonial reform. The 1907 debate was extremely sharp. Proponents of socialist colonialism secured an outright majority in the Congress Commission taking up the question. In the debate, blatantly racist views were put forward, especially mocking peoples of Africa. These views, however, were answered by Kautsky, Lebedor, and, num and a number of others who rejected the pro-colonialist perspective and called for support to the worldwide struggle against colonial rule. The Congress plenary opened up rejecting the pro-colonialist position of the commission, but only by a surprisingly narrow vote. Closely related to the colonialism debate was, was the one on immigration. These two debates were probably the sharpest in the history of the Second International, revealing quite clearly the opportunist cancer growing within it. A number of socialists at the time were succumbing to racist propaganda against non-white immigrants. Such views were advanced at the 1904 and 1907 Congresses most notably by Morris Hilquit of the American Socialist Party, as well as some others who supported restrictions limiting the arrival of immigrants from Africa and Asia. A number of prejudiced views were expressed in the debates along the lines that these immigrants were simply tools of the capitalists to lower wages and break strikes, and that they were too backward to become members of the organized working class. But the anti-immigrant position was heatedly and effectively rejected by the majority of the 1907 Congress as being anti-socialist. Led by left-wing delegates, the Congress came out against all such restrictions, viewing immigrants as fellow workers to be welcomed and organized into the struggle. The resolution adopted in 1907 reflected this position. Given the worldwide anti-immigrant campaign we now see, the 1907 resolution remains worth reading today. The fourth debate the book goes over was on women's suffrage, which took place at the 1907 Congress. A resolution drafted by Carl Zetkin and approved by a socialist, an international socialist women's conference on the eve of the Congress called for socialist parties to participate in the fight to obtain votes for women and to champion it without compromise. A debate occurred there coming from two directions. First, delegates from the British Fabian Society and Independent Labor Party advocated support for measures to grant limited suffrage to women based on property qualifications, viewing this as a step in the right direction. Such proposals were then being supported by some organizations of wealthier women. Second, some delegates from Austria backed the position of that country's Social Democratic Party during an election campaign that had recently been held there. A fight was underway in Austria for universal male suffrage, and the party had decided not to make an issue of women's suffrage, seeing it as secondary to what it saw as the more important fight. Opposition to both of these positions was led by Zetkin, who was able to rally the vast majority of delegates to support a strong resolution, whose perspective Zetkin was to bring into the communist movement over a decade later. The fifth and last debate I'll take up is on the question of militarism and war at the 1907 and 1910 Congresses. This was by far the most complex of all the debates. For the 1907 debate, four draft resolutions were presented. One of them stated that there was really no point in any special fight around war and militarism. It, it, it held that such struggles were simply a diversion, 
from the working class struggle for socialism. So some of the discussion focused on this. Two other proposed resolutions leaned in an ultra left direction, calling for the working class to answer all war threats with a general strike and an insurrection. Another resolution proposed by August Babel essentially restated the conclusions of previous Congresses and it presented in a, in a somewhat abstract way. Owing to the inadequacies of all four draft resolutions, Rosa Luxemburg introduced some amendments being proposed by her, Lenin, and Martov. These amendments sharpened the Babel resolution considerably, spelling out the need not just for the working class to oppose wars formally, but also to take concrete action against them and to do so in such a way as to advance the perspective of proletarian revolution. The Luxem Luxembourg Amendments, with their deeply revolutionary spirit, were incorporated into the resolution ultimately approved. After 1914, this resolution, therefore, as well as those adopted at subsequent Congresses that re repeated its, its conclusions, became a powerful weapon used by Lenin to illustrate the extent of the Second International's betrayal. However, having listened to the discussion you had several weeks ago, I would hesitate to characterize this resolution under the label of defeatism, at least as the term came to be formulated by Lenin after 1914. If you read the discussion at the 1907 Congress, you'll see that the theme of national defense was raised by a number of speakers, a holdover of an earlier era prior to the rise of imperialism. This theme was stressed several times, not just by open opportunists like Fomar, but also by defenders of Orthodox Marxism, such as Babel and Jules Gued, who would have heatedly rejected any suggestion that they were advocating the defeat of their own countries in a war. Three years later, the militarism debate at the 1910 International Congress focused on two things calls for disarmament and the international arbitration of disputes. As one reads the debate, the widespread allusions in these things stand out. Karl Roddick, a delegate from Poland, pointed out the utopian character of some of the points being raised, but he was largely ignored. Reading these debates on militarism carefully, you can see the coexistence both of the revolutionary internationalist standpoint as well as the arguments used to justify support for the imperialist war in 1914. Looking at these debates as a whole, they reveal clearly counterposed political trends. In several articles written in 1907, Lenin pointed to the existence of two trends in the Second International, a revolutionary Marxist one and an opportunist one. But these divisions weren't entirely clear cut. In the, militarism, in the Millerandism debate, for example, Babel was extremely sharp and clear in his condemnation of ministerialism. But his positions in the colonialism and militarism debates were not as strong. Similarly, Lederbohr was sharp on the question of immigration, but entertained big illusions on the possibilities of international disarmament. In these debates, you therefore notice a development of a third trend, centrist one straddling the two main counterpost positions. This category consisted of those who declared support for Marxist principles, but increasingly adapted in practice to the reformists and opportunists. The centrist trend fully revealed itself only after 1914, when it rationalized and gave excuses for the stance by the Second International's majority leadership, giving the support, giving support to the imperialist war. So what kind of balance sheet should we draw of the Second International? Perhaps the pre-war Second International's greatest achievement during its 25 years was to make progress in unifying the international working class movement under the banner of Marxism. 
It also helped disseminate and popularize the movement's strategic aim, the revolutionary overturn of the capitalist ruling class and its replacement by the rule of the proletariat as a first step toward the establishment of socialism. Lenin referred to these very strengths when he talked about the Second International's, quote, useful preparatory work. What about its weaknesses? I'll give my opinion of these. Clarity on exactly what these weaknesses were and weren't is important in order to avoid false views that dismiss the Second International entirely as a revolutionary movement. For one thing, even though the resolutions, the adopted resolutions of the Second International called for the revolutionary replacement of capitalism, the Second International as a whole lacked a clear perspective on the role of revolutionary action in such a transformation. The relationship between reform and revolution became a constant point of friction and debate within, within its parties. The loose organization of the Second International was another weakness. Uh, the International possessed moral authority and made decisions on broad policy and strategy to be put into practice by its affiliates. There was a positive side to this type of loosely federated structure, particularly in the Second International's early years as the movement consolidated itself politically. For example, in these years, Engel himself opposed efforts to create a strong executive bureau, given the likelihood that such a body would fall under do the domination of various reformist currents. But the lack of such a structure came to be a serious weakness over time. No mechanism existed for implementation of the international's decisions, even after the creation in 1900 of the International Socialist Bureau as the movement's executive body. Parties of the Second International did carry out important internationally coordinated actions, but these were generally organized on a party to party basis without any real central control or coordination. Another weakness involved the movement's geographic focus. Despite the fact that the Second International's reach extended to many countries, it was still predominantly a European and North American movement and never became a truly world organization. The only parties from outside Europe, North America and Australia that were ever represented at Second International Congresses during the 1889 to 1914 period were from Argentina, Japan, South Africa, and Turkish Armenia. While Congress resolutions gave support to various anti-colonial struggles, most sections of the movement still had an inadequate appreciation of them. Related to this, the international's resolutions often lacked an inad inadequate appreciation of the strategic allies the working class would need in its struggle, from toilers in the colonial world to working farmers and peasants small shopkeepers, victims of national oppression and others. Finally, the Second International came to be characterized by a gap between word and deed as the day-to-day -day practice of most of its parties became increasingly dominated by currents with a reformist and non-revolutionary outlook. I, I've, I've, stressed some, I've spent some time stressing the weaknesses of the Second International um, to avoid uh, the the idea that I'm, I'm predicting the Second International or giving it more credit than it's due. But it's important to, to have a full and accurate understanding of what these weaknesses were and what they weren't. I referred at the beginning to the narrative held by many Marxists that the Second International's legacy is of only limited value. That narrative can be effectively answered by looking at the revolutionary character of the adopted resolutions of the Second International, along with the defense of revolutionary principles found in the debates at its Congresses. However, there's a second narrative that's come into fashion in recent years, an idealization of the Second International with the goal of recreating it, at least in part. Among those identifying with this narrative, for example, are Eric Blanc, Bhaskar Sankara, and others. This narrative too is flawed. Insofar as it talks of the Second International's strong points, it actually identifies with the Second International's weaknesses, not its strengths. 
The reality of the Second International is much more complex, nuanced, and many-sided. Debating these alternative narratives is one of several reasons why I don't like the expression that you'll sometimes come across, that of Second International Marxism. I simply don't think it's helpful. It, I think it confuses more than it clarifies it. I think it oversimplifies the Second International and glosses over the competing trends uh, within it, pigeonholing the Second International into one of the narratives uh, I've mentioned. There's another problem with the Second International Marxist, Marxism label, as, as if there were only one version of Marxism within it, often identi identified with Kautsky. But there were many. The term also implies that we're dealing with a special and inferior version of Marxism, one that may be of interest to scholars or activists, archivists, but which has little relevance to anyone else. It discourages serious study you know, of the Second International, its accomplishments and its legacy. I'll conclude. The Second International of 1889 to 1914 obviously cannot offer a guidebook for the present. Nevertheless, properly examined in context, the experience of socialists a century ago can provide valuable lessons and examples. My view is that the Second International's tradition and legacy should not be handed over to those who don't deserve it. It belongs to us, along with other key historical experiences from the Russian Revolution and the Communist International up through other revolutionary struggles over the last century. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, comrade. That was a very clearly presented and highly interesting introduction, which goes well with Roger's previous uh, introduction, I think, who focused more on the foundation and why it broke apart, etc. Very interesting um, um, discussions taking place in the Second International. Comrades, um, if you if you want like to uh, ask a question or make a contribution, please uh, go to reactions and raise hand and I can I can bring you in. Um, a couple of questions first uh, from me, Mike. Um, it seems it, it's very interesting to to listen to your the five the five key debates you pointed out because at least, two of them I think are very, well, three of them actually are still very, very current. And they are, again, splitting the workers' movement, even the revolutionary left is, is split on the issues of um, Millerandism. I mean, you have currently, Syriza is again thinking about going into government. You've had Refundazione, all those, those issues, recent, recent issues going into government. Militarism, obviously, that's a that's a huge issue that's now um, splitting the left in terms, do you, do you have to support Russia? Do we have to support Ukraine, NATO, or is it actually sort of an independent working class uh, politics that could be pursued? Most interesting though, I found, um, well, not, not most interesting, but very interesting also, I found your um, idea about the, the immigration which is, a, which is also a, a subject that is coming up uh, massively at the moment in Britain because of Brexit chiefly. Um, and the, the, the idea that, you know, we, we, can't really, we can't really argue in favor of immigration. There's now a million, million immigrants come into Britain this year, which is some kind of record. And there's a lot of panic on the left. You know, that means they're lowering wages. There's the danger of them lowering wages and they're not gonna join unions, et cetera. Could you perhaps discuss the um, this particular um, um, issue, which which I found interesting, um, in a little bit more detail? You know, the how how comrades argued for a for a progressive view on you know how do you how do you incorporate immigrants or how did they argue in terms of against against those who wanted to keep people from Africa and Asia out? What was the the winning argument? How did they argue that through? Um, well, one of the things that they called for was that the they called for the trade for the trade union move to movement to take the lead in uh, in in championing immigrants and fighting for uh, uh, not not just against restrictions and fighting for a uh, a minimum wage uh, uh, in 
like give, giving full political rights to to immigrants when they when they came in that that workers uh, uh, that unionists from one country should have their membership transferred to the corresponding union as soon as they uh, reach the new country uh, and then they should have full political rights from the moment they arrive um, so it's uh, it, it's actually uh, in many ways it's 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 quite it's definitely quite relevant to the discussions that are taking place in all the uh, the uh, the countries of Europe and and the and the US for example um, right now um, in the um, you know in the, in the same way the people like Hillquit, you know they said well you know I, I have absolutely no racial prejudices at all it's just that they that uh, the, these yellow people from Asia don't uh, can't be organized because they're too backward you know, <laughs> you know it's it's the uh, um, actually you, you get similar arguments today from you know many other from various forces within um, uh, within the working class and other progressive movements too you know even if they don't uh, put it forward quite as blatantly as Hillquit did uh, for example but the uh, the, the idea behind it is still the same sorry I forgot to unmute myself <laughs> apologies amateur mistake um incorporating Immigrants into the workforce seems to be the the obvious thing, and giving them trade, you know, getting the unions to focus on getting them into membership and uh, avoiding um, wage dumping seems to be the the obvious um, thing to do. Um, also interesting, I thought was um, you know you're focusing on on weakness as well as uh, strength, and you say in order to you know not dismiss it, but of course in order we also need to learn. We need to learn from mistakes, and we, otherwise we we keep repeating them. And that's why looking at history is 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 so important. When you talked about the um, the loose organization, that was I found that interesting because um, you say Engels argued against a strong committee because he thought it would be it would be hijacked or, or run by by the the opportunists and the right. Did he come to regret it himself, or do you think there was a sort of, do you think that how it played out, he would have regretted it, or did, did he argue about that? Did, did he write about that at all? Um, I, 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 well, I, one can't really say whether he would have regretted it or not. What he, he simply uh, said, in, you know, a number of times, particularly around in, 1891, around the time of the uh, the Brussels Congress of the uh, of the Second International, when when at that time the host the host party um, was uh, you know had a lot of say in terms of the organization of the uh, of the of the Congress and so forth, and and was in some ways the caretaker of the of the movement um, uh, until the next Congress. And uh, you know, Engels pointed out, it, referring to in the first international, the General Council that um, you know that that actually Marx led, and uh, eventually Engels himself, um, you know, was actually had a, a central role uh, as a in the uh, in the activity of the first international, and there were some forces who called for the, the especially some of the, the, uh, the reformist and right-wing forces called for the same type of thing that they themselves could take over. And Engels was trying to, uh, you know, prevent that. It, you know, at, an, at that stage of the, when the movement was still consolidating itself, uh, it, it such, such a body would have been an obstacle to the development of the second international. At exact, you know, it's specifying exactly uh, when that changed, uh, uh, a step in the right direction was made when the International Socialist Bureau was created in 1900. But it was never given uh, its its purview was mainly to help organize uh, uh, Congress, you know, the the, the the next Congress organized meet, organized its own meetings, 
and as a sort of a vehicle for communication, but it, it never adopted any, uh, it never had any uh, ability to implement the decisions of previous Congresses. Mm. Um, before I bring in uh, Anne from the floor now, um, just one more question. Roger was quite, um, he drew a, the, a positive conclusion. He said that, you know, the, the example of the Second International having these debates and um, imploding over the World War, World War I, at least led to the Third International being founded on a clearer Marxist level or Marxist basis. Do you... Do you share that assessment? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's largely true. That's largely true. The uh, um, it, it was it was the development of the uh, of the you know of the uh, revolution. It was the revolutionary current within the, uh, the Second International um, that uh, based itself on the. Uh, you know, on the you know on the perspective and and on the resolutions of the Second International to a large extent, even though it it um, after especially after 1919, it didn't talk about that all that much. It talked Lenin talked about that quite a bit, you know, after 1914, uh, particularly the militarism resolutions. But after that, it was if, if you read you know read the uh, debates of Congresses of the uh, of the Common Turn, it, that was uh, it was less so. Would you would you think the um, the Second International had lasted much longer had World War One not broken out, or were the contradictions becoming so apparent and so strong that it would have died anyway? Well, well, the uh, the, the the contradictions of the the imperialist system were were such that it was going to happen sooner or later. Um, and the uh, the development of imperialist war, uh, the, the, what, what broke out in 1914, it could have broken out in 1916. It could have broken out in 1907. Could have broken out in 19. And they, they, there were all kinds of uh, war threats, you know, of of the uh, during this whole period uh, during the 1912, 1913, at the time of the Balkan Wars, it very easily could have. Uh, World World War One could have broken out then too, so it, it would have it would have happened uh, sooner or later. Thank you, comrade. Okay, comrades, um, I'm opening up from the floor now. If anybody has a question or a contribution, and remember, there are no wrong questions. There are also no wrong contributions. So please don't feel shy. Hi, Anne. Hi, hi, Mike. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think my camera is a bit weird, but I'll carry on. Um, so, okay, so that was really interesting. Um, and I've, I've had the advantage of reading not only under the socialist banner, but also been able to read some of your most recent work as it's in the development. Um, um, my, I just want to make a few points. What I think is that um, has been my experience of reading the proceedings of the Second International, the thing that has given me the most, I suppose, um, enjoyment really, or an insight is the is seeing Marxists in action, fighting for their ideas in, in action. So it not being, um, there's one Marxist um, like line, you know, that they're all together, but how they struggled within it and how, despite sometimes um, compromises, which were bad compromises, such as uh, such as Kotsky's compromise over the Millerandism issue, um, how on so many occasions they actually won. And if they didn't win, then they pulled the whole debate to the left. So it reminded me of being involved in kind of broader campaigns, you know, which included working class forces, um, say if you're involved in a strike and there'd be support groups and 
how in that situation you fought for your programmatic ideas and and managed to win so that to me was it's just so interesting to see that in action and to realize that rather than it being this plodding, boring, bureaucratic uh, body, it was actually tremendously um, controversial. And to see the way in which they debated with each other, um, for instance, on the Millerandism debate, it, it was so sharp, the arguments were so sharp and funny, you know, as well, people were humorous. It's just so interesting. Um, so for that point of view, I think it's just, it, it makes you realize that this is like a, a living history and such an interesting one. So I think all thanks are to Mike for, for, for doing this and for following up on this and for showing us what, that there, what um, I don't know, what an interesting history it is what an interesting history our movement is and how rather than accepting the kind of stereotype ideas that we need to also go and look at it. And like, for instance, also, I think one of the things that we get our stereotypical idea of it being, you know, completely a lost cause, you know, lost to reformism is from the third international itself. And my experience of reading the um, articles written by women in the uh, communist women's movement of being extremely dismissive. Um, you know, I remember having this discussion a couple of years ago with Mike when he gave a presentation about the fact that they were so dismissive. And, you know, like basically, if you didn't know anything else, you would think they were right because, well, these were the leaders, you know, the third international leaders and if they're saying that the second international was utterly useless then you would agree with them i mean i can see what mike is saying about lenin and and leading members of the common turn not having that exact view but it did become the view you know that it was that, that this was a, a utterly reformist um organization that basically sold out and was no use for anything. Don't bother going back and looking at it, you're wasting your time. Um, so I don't want to go on too long, but there's a there's a lot to say, I think. I mean, just one thing, I think I saw it in the comments there from Anthony Brain about how Lenin wanted to split from the Second International. I, I'm not aware of any move or, or, or view of, of his to do that. In fact, I think Mike was saying that there never was any proposal. And also, the, um, Anthony mentioned something about the Vanguard Leninist Party. Well, I don't think there was any plan to ever set up a Vanguard Leninist Party. It was only a reaction to the situation that the, that the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union found itself in. Which it, when it created this kind of a party, the party, I would say that Lenin wanted the Bolsheviks to be, and in fact, the party that the Bolsheviks were, uh, particularly and up to the revolution, and in, you know, in the very early years, was a party which was like the party of the SPD, which was like the Marxist parties of the Second International. So um, again, I think that there is something there that we need to. Um, really rectify um, in terms of people's points of view. And for me, just finally, Tina, I know I've been going on a long time. For me, what it, like I had the, the same prejudices before and it's been reading it has shown me that I was wrong. Not to say everything was perfect. You can see the problems in it, all of the problems, but just to see how the Marxists fought, um, I think is the most interesting aspect. Anyway, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Mike, would you like to respond to any of that? Um, well, what we could, uh, is, um, I mean, the, the one thing, the one thing I would just point out is that the, um, just to, uh, to, to, to agree with Anne on the, um, you know, the, the value of, of some of these debates is, um, you know, one thing about oral debates compared to, uh, you know, written exchanges and stuff, and in an oral debate, there's there's less of a um, a tendency to try to 
um, sand down the rough edges of uh, somebody's remarks or to try to make uh, your, your views more palatable uh, somehow with carefully crafted formulations and so forth. And in an oral debate, oftentimes you can, uh, they, they can take on a sharper character than, than you would sometimes uh, get in a uh, written exchange, which is one of the reasons why um, following these debates can be so valuable. Thank you. Um, ben, you would like to come in. Hi. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Hi, Mike. Um, congratulations on yet another book and a great talk. Um, I have noted down a few things. I thought you did a good job in particular of noting how um, not studying this history and not looking at our own traditions kind of hands the baton over to forces that, are, uh, that do not deserve it and that have betrayed the banner of socialism. I think what would also perhaps be worth mentioning in slightly more detail, which you didn't, is that that didn't just occur in the capitalist West, as you know, like clearly in the Soviet Union, in the, in the Eastern Bloc, the, the reason that many of us have these traditions that have these prejudices or particularly ingrained views about the Second International that, that are to a large extent based on, on myth is precisely because of the, the subsequent development of the history of this movement within the Soviet Union, right? So what you get is this the, the, the whole party of a new type, the vanguard party stuff, really becomes a kind of form of almost like religious incantation. Uh, from the 30s in, 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 in official Soviet publications, uh, Stalin's Foundation of Leninism, you can go through all the whole GDR literature. The idea is that uh, the, 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 the false idea, and it's one that we've picked up in, in, our, in our kind of mother's milk, as it were, on the left, is that the uh, Bolshevism had absolutely nothing to do with second international Marxism, as you say, you know, so-called in that experience. Absolutely nothing. They were, you know, fundamentally opposed because Ala Stalin and everyone the second international was kind of innately uh, flawed from the outset. It was kind of predestined almost genetically to end up where it did, right? Uh, and Bolshevism uh, was something completely different entirely. And that's, you know, that's, that is the kind of paradox here is that on the one hand, many of the, the, the fundamental texts that we read, what is to be done? Uh, Luxembourg's organizational questions of, uh, of, of Russian social democracy, Trotsky's uh, uh, um, prospects of the Russian revolution, all of these things, they come from debates within the Second International right? <laughs> that, that take place within this body, uh, and they're kind of our guiding text. But then at the same time, we've been taught that all this stuff is a load of nonsense, and we shouldn't really deal with it, right, because it was doomed to fail. So I think that's, in, in terms of the contextual thing, and this kind of idea that uh, you know, why is it that many of us have dismissed it for so long? I think we also have to look to the experience of, of, of you know, official uh, uh, Stalinism, but also that something that's been absorbed by, you know, uh, anti-Stalinist trends as, as well, uh, you know, of, of various stripes. And, you know, you talked about your own experience there. So I think that that is the true one of one of the many uh, true uh, merits of this approach. It's related to this whole question of Lenin split as well, because you see in the... Um, in the in the 20s really a shift in 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 soviet historiography on the party uh 20s early 30s um where as i say this idea somehow that basically lenin's whole thing was to go out and split up the second international um no that wasn't the perspective whether it was the, whether it was the right perspective or not is another question but certainly for lenin luxembourg Tetkin, these, these people their idea was that okay we know we've got these opportunists we know we've got some vacillators, but basically we will go out and we will win and keep the international. And that's why it's a shock. You know, they wanted to win the majority of the international. That's why it's such a shock uh, when things happen as they do. And indeed, if you look at someone like was a Luxembourg, per uh, this stuff got on up with the Nazi invasion. Of, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, if you if you read uh, the Spartacus letters, which is the uh, it's a legal publication of the German left in in during the First World War. The two guiding principles at the top is that there's the, the resolution on against war from the Second International and the duty, it says, to uh, implement the, the resolutions such as that one of the Second International, take precedence over any other organizational duty. So, again, it's just looking at what one of the, the nice things you, that you do in your talk in the book is, of course, show that is that, you know, the, the, the very best of the, of the revolutionary tradition came out of this experience and sought to uphold it 
and and there and build upon it uh, as time went on. Looking back, second international failed. So did the third international, whether we like it or not, as well. So we have to, you know, as Mike said, that none of these things should be templates. But it's about drawing on uh, some of the best things. And you know, Anne mentioned the, the 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 debates and things. What's striking to me, and again, this is only scratching the surface. These are the official debates, finally for the first time, uh, available alongside the resolutions for the first time. But you know, you, you then go into all the the, the masses of periodicals of propaganda of materials that produce the, the, the theoretical level is generally very very high isn't it and that's I think one of the um, one of the, the central things um, I had a few just very quick points or questions to you Mike on um, the first one you described as female suffrage as as reform and I can see why you would say that so you said alongside you know state insurance and, and uh, 10 hour day and, and all the rest of it my impression just from reading and you know more about this than me but my impression from reading uh Tedkin and others in the kind of 1900s 1890s is that they're very much of the view that female suffrage is actually kind of incompatible with capitalism they, they obviously they look to New Zealand and other places but for them in Germany their certainly in Germany their approach is okay Female suffrage is kind of uh, um, a demand that goes with this uh, uh, this overall strategy to achieve power, because the capitalists will not give uh, uh, the, the willingly concede uh, in 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 the German Kaiserreich the vote to the to, to the women because that would lead to the victory of social democracy. Then you'd you know you'd in, you'd introduce the uh, all, all the program of social democracy etc. So were there debates around that in 1907? This is stuff that I haven't quite yet looked at because I think for some. It, it, certainly, I think Sekin speaks for many on the left when she says that actually the, 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 the suffrage question was viewed as actually part of kind of the, the revolutionary program overall, not just a kind of reform. Some others saw it as a, as a kind of reform, if you like, OK, we can we can gain a big step forward here. But it seems to me from reading Sekin, it was part of this package of once we get that, if we get that, uh, the whole system collapse base, collapses, basically. Right. Um, and just uh, secondly, on the on the defenses and the defeatism thing. I don't want to defend August Babel because I think this documents come out recently. You may have seen as a book uh, where Babel is engaged in semi, well, it, it's kind of a private hidden correspondence with leading lights in Britain trying to achieve peace, right? That's it. That's it at all costs. You know, what can I do to try and establish a narrative, a dialogue between the two governments, et cetera, to avoid peace? I don't want to, I don't want to defend his idea, uh, his, his approach here, which had a certain pro-England, pro-Britain uh, aspect to it. But I do think that it's important to raise the. I don't. So, that in a sense, the, the the argument you you outlined is similar to Luxembourg's. I think in in the in the juniors uh, pamphlet, which is to say, well, I don't think that just with the rise of imperialism, the question of national def, uh, self defence immediately goes away. Does that make sense? Because in, it, there was always that threat looming over Germany, and that's where Babel says. You know, if the Russians invade, I'll be the first to stick a rifle on my back and we'll organize our forces, etc. You know, it could have been the case that World War One played out differently than it did, right? That's not to excuse what the German SPD did, because clearly, you know, even, even in August 1914, it's clear this is an imperialist war. It's not just, it's not the, the, a question of German national defense. But I do think uh, in terms of uh, uh, strategy, we have to, we can't just say national defense, wars of national defense are kind of a thing of the past. Uh, uh, you know that they were kind of more relevant in the early 19th, uh, in the in the late 19th century or something. Um, so that I think there is some there's a, there's an element of truth in what Babel is getting at there. What would obviously be important and what he indeed stressed is that is the working class independence and the fact that really it, he thought anyway it would be very difficult for the Kaiser regime. Obviously, he died in 1913. It would be very difficult for the Kaiser regime to wage any war. Uh, uh, when, when when you've got red barracks, as he puts it, with the growth of, of the SPD also in the army. Um, just one final point again on, on centrism. I think one of the things that you brought up really well, you mentioned, I think, Kautsky, uh, sorry, my cooker clock's going off. Uh, you mentioned Kautsky, um, you know, shifting on various questions, you know, of being more leaning towards the right here or on the left here. You mentioned Lederbohr, who was... Um, uh, you know, on, as you say, good on good on immigration, uh, but had all sorts of passive disillusions. I think one of the the, the, very, the great merits of going back to these things is precisely to see the Second International as a living body, where it wasn't just this kind of fixed thing. You've got the three wings or the three 
uh, um, component parts. There's, there's evolution, there's, there's development, there's contradiction. You know, Bernstein goes from the far right to more of a centrist position on the war, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, it's very important to, uh, to do that in order to set it in its context and to avoid kind of teleologically saying, oh, this person there was a centrist. You know, we talked about this before on the podcast, we did and everything. I, I happen to think that some of the centrists in the German debates in 1910 were right over Rosa Luxemburg, who was on the, clearly on the left. Uh, but then on other questions, clearly that, you know, the, the cent- what's known as centrist Marxism, some of its leading uh, proponents ended up uh, uh, betraying the cause of, uh, of socialism, as we all know. But I think it's kind of, it's very important to see these things as not static, preordained and, and kind of inevitable, but more as an outcome of, of you know, of all sorts of uh, uh, contingent factors. So, um, yeah, I'll stop talking there. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Ben. Do you want to reply to a few things, Mike? Um, well, well, two things. One is on the uh, on Ben's question on the uh, on the women's suffrage uh, question. Um, I, I, I'm I was very interested in the whole debate on at the, uh, the on women's suffrage in the Second International because I, we've all, I've also just um, uh, edited a helped edit a book on the communist women's movement in the um, you know in the early in the early twenties. Uh, which also Zetkin was uh, one of the central leaders. Um, and one of the things I think is uh, that I noticed was, was there's a consistency in Zetkin's writings, you know, uh, as a leader of the uh, socialist women's movement and the, uh, after 1907 and in the, uh, the communist women's movement after 1920, uh, which is, uh, no, that the the um, her, her her under her presentation and understanding of um, both the um, the connection of the the struggle for women's rights and its connection to the working class movement. Um, and at the same time, the revolutionary, what I would uh, sort of formulate as the revolutionary dynamics of the struggle of, for women's equality in, in general. And this is a perspective that she you know, fairly consistently raised in uh, both within the, within the Second International and then the, the Socialist Women's Movement and within the Communist International uh, and the uh, Communist Women's Movement. And of course, it, it's one of the things that that, that would that's would be one of the things that's uh, be most relevant for today. And and it's very, um, very very few people uh, raise it in the same way. The the other point on um, that that Ben raised, which which I think is is uh, you know uh, is worth a lot of thought, is you know is. Uh, you know, is, is his point about the need for um, viewing, you know, the, the, on the question of uh, defenseism, national wars, um, a national defense, to view it historically and not, uh, not j- just, just simply schematically that, um, uh, the, but there, there is the, the, the question of national wars that in European national wars in the 19th century, um, uh, there were there in the, in the fight there were actually a number of them against the empire and and it, it, the national wars continued but it, it, they they became combined in different permutations with the development of the imperialist world system. Um, so. So whereas, for example, you had in 1914, Germany's uh, violation of Belgium's right to self-determination when it, it invaded um, when it invaded Belgium at the beginning of the First World War, uh, you know, but in the, the, the point of, uh, of the left wingers like Lenin and so forth is that that did not change the, uh, the, the context of the imperialist uh, um, the, the imperialist war, uh, war as a whole, um, and it's it, you. You can read various um, and some of Le- Engels's writings from the eighteen nineties, 
you know, he makes some of the similar points that Ben raised about uh, not not that he was going to pick up a rifle and defend, some, but but he, yeah, but uh, but but sy sympathetically to the the fight for national national defense. Um, uh, and you know it's true. You, you can see how some of these these same arguments that had been you know long been put forward you know within the socialist movement by Engels, by Babel, by many others. After 1914, some of these same things were used to justify the support for the imperialist war. Um, and so, so you see all the, the various the, the the contradictory ways some of these arguments um, are are put forward, but the only, you have to, it's important to understand historically and where they came from and what context that they uh, came from. And you, you can't abstract it from, uh, from that context. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to read out a question from Jara Handala, who ha doesn't have a microphone. He's, um, he said we could read it out, um, which is about the, the, the question of Millerandism and participating in government or not. I mean, it's interesting, of course, is that the, the SPD turned out, was the most um, vocal in opposing that. And then, of course, we, we know what happened very few years later. Um, so Jara is asking the um, the issue, isn't it, isn't it implausible these days that a party electoral front would be able to keep its support if its commitment was not to be in government, unless it could actually implement a minimum program of sorts. The voters, the supporters want improvements. So rationally, they would soon switch allegiance, however temporarily, to uh, an organization that is willing to vote for some improving legislation. So the minimum program approach can never advance beyond this materialist constraint upon its ability to become the majority politics amongst the oppressed of capitalist society. It's a social bind of sorts. So before 1914, the disappointment of the last hundred years hadn't happened and hope was still a powerful motivator. Today, how can one envisage circumstances when the material constraint could be sublated? Isn't it voluntarist, idealist um, social ontology to claim that it is plausible to pursue a political project based on staying out of government, whilst under the social forcing of the value dimension of the capitalist relation? Um, so basically, you know, how how do you how do you reach people if you can't? If you can't vote for for making things better, did these did these kind of debates have that dimension? Did 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 comrades argue like that at the time? Well, the the position of the uh, you know of the sec of uh, nobody ever said that that um, and none of those who opposed Millerandism ever said that raised staying out of government or not fighting to. Take on government. What what they uh, what they opposed was taking positions as uh, a junior members of a capitalist uh, ministry, where where the, where it's uh, um, you know where they 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 were they would simply be figureheads in um, in uh, in a capitalist government. Uh, they they for example they uh, they they uh, in the Millerand. The, the, the government that Milleron joined, the uh, the defense minister was the person who had uh, was had been behind the execution of thousands of uh, uh, veterans of the Paris Commune in 1871. He was a butcher, uh, and he was the he was his a fellow minister of uh, Milleron. Um, but the the, the SPD uh, ran in elections, and all all the all the uh, socialist party they ran in elections. They uh, were prepared to accept um, uh, office if they won it. Um, they 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 voted. They made a point of they voted for all progressive measures in the various parliamentary bodies. Um, you, you know they didn't abstain for any of that, and they um, or, or as Babel put it in the thing, they. Um, uh, the SPD was gracious enough to accept whatever concessions that the uh, capitalists would, would would throw out to the workers. So, um, 
they and they were the they were the main ones who actually fought for the, fought for these measures. So, um, so, so it, it's um, so it's really not the the issue wasn't participation in government in and of itself, but participation as a uh, uh, joining a uh, a capitalist. A, a minister, a minister in a capitalist government, and it certainly was uh, was not opposition to parliament. And you know, comrades were arguing quite strongly for using parliament as a as a platform. And he often can uh, achieve more in opposition, perhaps than he can as part of the government. Um, the next speaker from the floor is Ken, please. Ken, are you there? Yeah, there. Okay, thank you, Tina. You were kind enough to say at the beginning that there are no daft questions, so I, I may use that as a defence in, in a few minutes. But the question I wanted to, to put is that, you know, some of the ideas put forward in the Second International are viewed as bad or reformist or undesirable. Is it the case that we are now in such a a relatively poor state in various countries across the globe that some of the quote bad unquote ideas of the second international would be relatively useful now when I mean, Sarisa was cited uh, at one point earlier in the conversation is there a context you know in some places where ideas rejected from the second international might be modified now to be more useful so Thank you. And thank you very much for an extremely clear um, description of what went on in the Second International. Mike, do you want to reply to that? Um, well, I, I'm just not, I, I think you sort of have to, would, one would have to be concrete as to what exactly um, the the negative the negative the things that we rejected or that were rejected in the debate what exactly would would be would uh, would we support socialist colonialism now would we support immigration restrictions would we support uh, property qualifications on uh, uh, votes for women would we um, um, so, so the, the, the things that would be support, give our support to imperialist war. Um, so, so in terms of the positions that, that the, I, I, I really would have a hard time pointing to any position that, mm -hmm. that, the, that the opportunist wing raised that which should be emulated and um, now simply because we don't happen to be living in an immediately revolutionary period, um, or, uh, or, but I'm not sure. I was thinking, well, I, I certainly wasn't suggesting the context of suffrage for women, but immigration restrictions is something you mentioned, and there is a big debate going on on that subject at the moment. And personally speaking, I don't agree with immigration restrictions, but you know, there seems to be, there, we don't have a significant political party which is arguing for unrestricted immigration at the moment. Labour Party here appears to be trying to argue merely that they could do conservative policies more effectively. So is there any context in which some of those debates might be a useful way of moving towards something more genuinely democratic and rational? Question mark. Um, well, I just think in, in general, you, um, you don't, um, in politics, you don't win gains by compromising on principle. Um, and you defend your principles and you take whatever, um, uh, whatever gains you can get and, and that, that, that the relationship of forces in any given, um, Given struggle allow you, um, but you you don't give up ahead of time. Um, uh, uh, what you 
you know, what you're fighting for, because then you'll wind up getting, you know, you wind up getting even less. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Steve, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, very interesting talk. I don't know a lot about the dis discussions and debates of the Second International. I also came five minutes later as well. So mine is more a way of a uh, question, really. Um, and it's, you gave, I think, national colonial women's question and war as big debating issues. They're all democratic questions in one sense. So I wanted to know, did they debate the question of the Democratic Republic? And the reason why I say that is because it, it just came up. The point about the minimum programme is it's a revolutionary programme of reforms. Uh, it's not about participating in a reformist capitalist government. And the essence of the minimum programme is it's a republican programme. Uh, it's a program for a democratic republic, which implies, and it did imply, if you look, if you look at the two main parties, the social, the German Social Democrats and the RSDLP, the German Social Democrats really dropped the demand for a democratic republic, and Engels criticised them for this. Uh, so they made their compromise with the Kaiser regime, whereas the RSDLP did not. So the RSB was strongly committed to overthrowing or getting rid of the Tsar, but German social democracy was not so committed to getting rid of the Kaiser. So in a sense, when, when Engels says that um, opportunism in the German party was caught up by them dropping the demand for a republic, it, he said this, is, this opportunism will eventually show itself in some form. So maybe 19... 14 was a point when it all came out, you know, the fact that they'd already compromised with Kaiserism in a way that the Bolsheviks didn't compromise with Tsarism. So, I, again, I don't know the answer to that, but did they debate the Democratic Republic in the way they debated these other democratic questions that you outlined? So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, well, well I, would, I would be hesitant to label the SPD. Um, yes, yes, there were, you know, there were criticisms made at various times about, about, you know, dropping the demand for, for a republic, but I, I don't, I, I would not, uh, I, I think it, go, it goes a little too far to say that they're um, uh, adapting to the Kaiser, to the Kaiser's regime at all. They, um, and in several in the debate on Millerandism, you know, uh, in Mabel's speech, she points to the, uh, you know, that their uh, stresses the, their the SPD support for a republic, uh, how they're socialist, you know, how, how they're socialist Republicans. Uh, but at the at the same time, he makes the point that that um, the, the correct point that while support that you, you also can't have illusions and, uh, and a republic alone, that whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's a republic or a monarchy, it's still a bourgeois, uh, you know, it's still a, a, a bourgeois s system that they, uh, that, they were, that they were fighting in. So um, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure uh, Ben would probably have a lot more information, you know, in, in terms of the, uh, the the whole the way that whole uh, that that whole develop, thing developed, and you know he's he's written quite a bit about it. Mm, thank you, comrade. Ben had to leave the meeting. Um, I think his his pot was cooking or something, or was making noises. Um, Andrew Sherrod, you've got your hand up, but you're not. Um, you don't want to be made a panelist. Do you want to just ask a question? You can now speak. Andrew, you there? Nope. You hear me now? Oh. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Hi. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I just like looking at the uh, Brexit question and stuff with uh, immigration and whatnot. Uh, for me, it's massively important that everybody who lives within a certain area has democratic rights, you know, over resources and this, that and the other. And, you know, for me personally, we need to move away from kind of a racist question and stuff. Oh, just 
racism and full stop. But having like kind of a democratic control over your own environment isn't a bad thing uh, on many, many accounts. And what we see when uh, the accessibility towards resources, et cetera, through, you know, free movement and labor and stuff like that becomes problematic is basically on those kind of grounds. And, you know, the first international, moving back to that, to do with kind of uh, thing with scab labor and stuff like that, is uh, a massive important question, but we're not kind of tackling that issue, if you know what I mean. And I'm just wondering what the panel and everyone else thinks about that. Thank you, Andrew. Mike, do you want to respond? Um, well, actually, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew, do you, wanna, do you want to rephrase it briefly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, well, First International, in part, was based on uh, the limitation of kind of labour within certain, well, basically scab labour, you could say, uh, in a Marxist kind of, uh, you know, context and stuff like that. But what I'm trying to say is, so how do we deal with resources and the movement of labour and people within that kind of context? Uh, is this still a bit too abstract? I don't know. Okay, you were saying we shouldn't just say um, you're racist if you um, find immigration, if problems with immigration, you think there are other issues that socialists should consider, like... Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But and stuff, yeah. yeah, was, yeah. Mike, was that, was that the discussion in the Second International? I mean, you unless you know <laughs> about today's views, but I think we're, we're talking about the Second International concretely, so... Um, well, you know, well, the, oh, this was the uh, the the late the, the, the context in which uh, this came up. Uh, you know, uh, the the late nineteenth century, the early twentieth century. There was a massive uh, movement of labor. You know, throughout the world, there were, um, I mean, twenty million immigrants to the United States, five million immigrants to Australia, a million immigrants to Argentina. Um, so th this was actually the, the, the movement of, uh, well, immigration itself, you know, has or, the movements of population, you know, is, you know, goes back thousands of years. Uh, the, the, um, the movement of peoples for, for purposes of work and labor was a relative, is a relatively uh, new, uh, was a relatively new phenomenon for for society, and this was what um, uh, what the Second International was was debating. Um, it actually came up originally in 1903 with a debate over the um, in, in the emigration of Belgian workers to France. Um, but but then it what. Um, but then it, it all of it, then at the same time, the some of the opportunist forces with the Second International just immediately started talking about the the immigration of yellow labor or black labor, uh, you know, um, you know, giving it a uh, giving it a, a, a racist um, a racist view. So so yet yeah, yes, they're in, in term, but you know, I mean, part of they they were. The, the different measures they they spent a lot of time talking about the the organizing the conditions on the ships bringing immigrate bringing immigrants from from different countries and the, the need to to set to set standards to fight for the right you know fight for you know, fight for various rights so so there there are real there are real questions here that more than just more than just the question of whether you support restrictions or not. That's one aspect of it. But then the, the broader thing of what 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 positive things that you fight for, what 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 should be the demands of the union of the trade union movement in terms of wages, working conditions, and, um, and so forth. So yes, there there are there are uh, certainly you know complexities that that uh, that the second international debated and that any any working class movement would have to discuss. Thank you, comrades. Um, 
Ian, please. Good evening, comrades. Um, just a brief question. Um, in preparation for this, I was reading about many of the sort of attempts to establish a second international before it was finally established. I mean, the, the debates between the possibilists and the Marxists, as it were. Um, and given what you've said about the content of some of the debates, it just occurred to me, well, why was Lenin quite so surprised that uh, th there should be an opportunist tendency within the Second International? Was it, do you feel that he was kind of, as it were, overawed by the prestige of the German Social Democratic Party? And secondly, um, <clears throat> given the, the uh, divisiveness and destructiveness of the anarchists in the First International, it's understandable, perhaps, why um, anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists were excluded from the Second International. But could you give us a flavour of how that process came about? Was it that they simply didn't apply? I mean, I know the IWW and the <clears throat> CNT were affiliated to the IWA rather than to the Second International. But was there a, a conscious policy of excluding? Because it was quite interesting as well that uh, you know, in what, 1910, the IWW was remarkable in, in that it, it consciously was one of the few organisations that did recruit, irrespective of colour of skin or whatever else, uh, and or gender for that matter. So, um, there's, given that there are no silly questions, there's a couple uh, to be getting on with. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Mike, would you like to? Um, well, I, I don't think Lenin had any um, illusions that there wasn't widespread opportunism in the in the Second International and in the uh, German SPD. He, he, you know, he wrote about it repeatedly. Um, he uh, he was certainly surprised by its collapse in 1914. I think in terms of in terms of realizing the extent of, of, of the opportunist corrosion and um, and the um, basically the surrender of the uh, you know of Kowski and the centrists um, centrists within the SPD to the to the open um, to the open opportunism. As to the uh, the anarchists, um, they actually it was they they were anarchists at um, actually the first four congresses of the Second International, and um, they quite 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 disruptive no, noisy disruptions that they they would make they um, uh, and the. Uh, you know, eventually in 1896, they were definitively basically sort of cast out. Um, it, it's one thing it should be said, if you go back and read the, the resolutions and stuff, it's becomes the, the first, I would say the first 11 years of the Second International from 1889 to 1900, it's actually the, the Second International's um, uh, in many ways, its deliberations were very similar to those of the first international. Um, and it wasn't until really 1900 where a whole host of new questions came up that it um, it began, it, it, it somewhat takes a little bit more, more modern feel in terms of the type of society that we live in now and some of the same issues, whether it's colonialism, immigration, um, you know, all, you know, all, all these other questions, um, the way the war question, the way the question of war and militarism came out. So, um, so, so anyway, that's how the context of the anarchists, it, 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 by the way, since I, since I've been working also on the communist international too, it's the, uh, the, uh, when the communist movement was organized, they made a, a special effort to, uh, towards not primarily the anarchists, but to the the syndicalist wing of that of that current, and a number and large, um, actually thousands of of those coming from revolutionary syndicalism were uh, one to and became members of the communist movement. And uh, you know, it was a big effort made and 
both in the on the trade union level and, and in, the, uh, in the party itself. Thank you. Um, we've got, we're coming to an end now. We've got the two more um, people there. There's Anne wants to ask another question, but I'm going to take Anthony first. Hi, comrade. Yes, uh, I first heard of you about 21, 22 years when I went into the American SWP bookshop in London and you were with John Riddell. Uh, but you did mention Trotsky today uh, and you're echoing some of Barnes's revisionism on the workers and farmers government because the farmers and peasants and corn to London and Trotsky were middle class because they're scattered in between the aristocracy, the capitalists and the workers. Uh, 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 and they can go over to the working class like revolutions like China, Vietnam, Yugoslavia by Stalinism, but also by Castro. But John Riddell was expelled because uh, they moved away from defending the colonial revolution during the Iraq war. Uh, the Barnes has adapted to Trump very much. He, he supported the overturn on the Roe v. Wade. Uh, I, I, I think that's interesting. Uh, but but uh, the, 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 the Communist Party of Great Britain supporters have really uh, degenerated. First, when I first met them when they were 11, they were hardened Stalinists. Then they went over to Shatmanite theories and the other zigzag of new class theories. Uh, they, uh, they were not support the colonial revolution. They were Stalinophobic on Serbia. Uh, and then we got the new complication of the neo Nazi forces invading Russia. And we know what they do if they have the forces, like a mass privatization. And the bourgeoisie openly supported them uh, and they massacred a, the, uh, massacre a lot of the forces. But the, the, the thing is about. Uh, this, uh, well, it's, well, the, the, the key thing they've also overturned the Communist Party of Great Britain is the Leninist Vanguard Party. And the, uh, I mean, uh, even Sadly Seville published uh, the Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, which dealt with uh, saying that you've got a liberal view of the state, you've abandoned the revolution, it's all the degeneration for many years. Now, in the Trotsky government and in the Bolshevik, by tendency of faction as fits are not the same, a tendency to have one or two districts to organize a faction relationship degenerated, but it doesn't mean a split. A Pat Burns of liquidation is by the point once they build a revolutionary. Uh, um, come on, Anthony, do you have a question or a comment on the second international? Oh, I thought I'm going to go on to now. But okay, that, let's, let's uh, focus but on that. Uh, but, uh, but, but the second international came out of a real radicalization. Uh, because you had a capitalist crisis from 1870. If you read it, the Church Congress, uh, written by some of the reformist unions, they're talking about the fight for socialism, the economic crisis, the poverty. It was quite a radical Congress. Uh, and the anarchists, I, I think the anarchists didn't go into the Church. Uh, then you had two Congresses, the Populist and the Marxist Congress. Uh, uh, and then 1905, there was a, a uh, was two more parts. 1905 was a real radicalization. Because uh, it slowed down the First World War in Russia, uh, it, it led to the anti-colonial statements and the anti-war positions uh, being out there. And if the 1905 had succeeded with the workers, state, then the Senate International one would degenerate. Could have had war revolution. The metrics maybe been salvaged because they merged back with the uh, merged back with the Bolsheviks. Uh, legal Marxism was strong in 1898. He did, the more capitalism goes eastwards, the more reactionary it becomes, linked up with Zars, and then he made a deal with the Tsar to get the Marxist lines published, but then on a reformist basis, didn't want to fight Tsarism. But, uh, 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 but the main thing you should talk about is Trotsky in 1905. Uh, they said in the First World War, this war goes wrong. Who's going to be the person? Oh, Trotsky's going to lead it in the carriage if, we get, if this war goes wrong. And we've got the biggest capitalist crisis now. Mass upheavals are coming. And we go for the only missing factor is the crisis of leadership. Uh, and when the American SWP went, they had to make much more concessions uh, in order to isolate until they didn't get a vote. If that's resolved, you get a lot more concessions. They're going to have to make it for stability anyway. But the lessons of this is very important. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Anthony. I think um, I bring in uh, Anne now, and then you can perhaps uh, sum it up as well. That's the last contribution from the floor. Hi, Anne. Okay, thanks. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to come back. <clears throat> there was something that I wanted to raise the first time. So I wanted to ask Mike about the idea, which seems to me to be very prevalent in the international, of capitalism continuing to play a progressive role in relation to the 
development of the productive forces and therefore connected with that capitalism playing a progressive role in the countries which have been colonialized. So therefore the idea that they need to go through capitalism and therefore colonialism is itself part of the experience and we can only um, fight for as much kind of ma as many rights for the um, indigenous people within that process as possible but they still have to go through it as opposed to the idea of self-determination which uh, I, I mean I think there may be some re references to self-determination but it doesn't seem to me to be like a strong tendency within it um, within the second international, the question of self-determination. So th that that's really my point. Just the role, the idea of capitalism being progressive in the colonies um, because they had to go through it um, and that basically that they wouldn't be doing the indigenous people any favors if they allow them to rule themselves because they would be at a low lower level um, and wouldn't achieve socialism. Um, if left to their own devices. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. Um, Mike, when you're replying, uh, it would be fantastic if you could also use this as a summing up, perhaps, and discuss, perhaps, the from your point of view, the, the key lesson that we should take away when we hear about the Second International, if that is possible to have one key lesson. Thank you. Um. Well, just in in, uh, in terms of Anne's question, um, it was it was the um, the opportunists in particular, Van Cole and uh, his his co thinkers, who raised the question of that um, that how uh, basically support the need to support the imposition of capitalism in the in the colonies that. That was not the those that was not raised by uh, those opposing the socialist colonialist perspective, and indeed, you know, some some people did actually uh, recall the uh, the points that Marx had made around the the possibility in relationship to Russia of uh, of of actually in the context of a of development of socialism around the world that it would it would be possible to at, at times to avoid some of having to go through the the development of capitalism in, in different countries um, but, but saying that I think Anne raises a uh, it actually was one of the uh, uh, weaknesses of, of in the second international, on the, on the colonial question is seeing is the failure to really point out the colonial masses themselves as the architects for their own liberation. Um, th this was, this was a, uh, part of it is understandable given the, the limited, what I refer to as the, 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 the weakness in the geographic extension of the Second International, that it was primarily a, a European and North American um, movement. Um, but it was, um, you know, but that is something that that is actually noticeable when you go when you go through it. And, um, you know, I, I pointed out that it, the the one Second International leader who who really um, took this up was Lenin. Who was who was uh, before the First World War was a member of the International Socialist Bureau, and his article on um, back backward Europe and advanced Asia, you know, would, um, uh, is is one was actually one of the clearest uh, presentations that uh, the idea that the that the masses of the in the colonial countries. Uh, are will be are and will be a, a revolutionary force, and of course that was that basic idea became a foundation stone of the communist international. 
Um, so on the, you know, stepping back and um, and uh, looking at the, you know, the the uh, the second international, I think it's important to 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 recognize the revolutionary character of the resolution the, of the formally adopted uh, resolutions of the second international and, and it's the 25 years uh, before the first world war uh, you know and, and at the same time the um, you know the development of clear trends in the international uh, primarily that between uh, revolutionary Marxism and uh, open opportunity, you know, and and opportun opportunism and reformism, um, which played out in a number of questions, and more more than just the ones that I mentioned. There were there were many other debates in the Second International, other than besides the five that I I, I selected these these I chose these five be partially because of of their relevance to uh, dispute issues today and also because of the, the the clarity in which you saw some of the emergence of these the consolidation of these trends um, so so you you had the, uh, so under understanding both the the revolutionary uh, character of the of the decisions and the resolutions adopted by it, as well as the consolidation of, of the development of trends, uh, it helps point to the the relevance of this legacy uh, for understand and and for understanding our own continuity, where where we are, where where we came from, um, the things that we can and should be studying. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a rich it's a rich legacy that, in general, has been underutilized, certainly for the last century, um, and it, it's important to um, that we you know we don't we don't see this legacy to the uh, today's social democrats. Um, who, 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 who reject the, uh, you know, what the Second International was, you know, prior to uh, prior to 1914. So it, it's a, a subject that's worth um, studying. It's worth, you know, keeping an open mind out about. And th th there's many points that uh, can be, um, Discuss, disputed, um, uh, in terms of the uh, different assessments of of the balance of, of of various things. All these things can and should be should be discussed and debated by um, you know by by socialists by uh, by socialists by communists by Marxists of all um, of all currents. So um, if, if this uh, helps encourage people to go back and do that, then I'm, then I'm, then I'm certainly satisfied. Absolutely, thank you very much. I think it's, um, it's also fascinating because the way you've outlined it showed how relevant those discussions still are today. And you know, the, obviously the social democratic parties today are Labour Party, we're not, we're not talking about them, but, there are there are trends on the socialist left um, where where all these these uh, issues are still being debated, hotly debated, and are still controversial. And there's different views. And if you are thinking about a, a world parliament of of work, the working class movement, as you put it, you will have lots of different viewpoints, and some of these issues will have to be resolved, and we will have to win people over so uh, an interesting discussion still how how to do that was it wrong was it right the way you know they've worked with opportunists right right to the end 
um, is is an is an ongoing discussion how you how you do win people over to to a more uh, advanced socialist um, Marxist revolutionary viewpoint. So very interesting. Thank you very much, Mike. I think that was a very uh, enlightening debate and very interesting questions from the floor as well. Thank you very much, comrades. Um, next week we are looking at Marx and ideology with Ian Spencer. And we've got a really interesting uh, program uh, lined up now. We're looking at Marx and money, Marx and the, and the economy, then Marx and religion, one of my favorite subjects. Um, he didn't just say opium, uh, you know, opium for the people, etc. Marx and law. And then we'll spend a few sessions on looking at Marx and party building and Marxism and party building, including the social, uh, the SPD in Germany, um, the Bolsheviks, um, how they developed, how what changes they went through, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and how that can all inform us. Um, just seeing it's uh, the transitional program been up yet? No, it's not been discussed. Um, we're not looking at Trotsky, but we will be looking at the minimum maximum program, and I'm sure within that context, um, the transitional program by uh, Trotsky will come up in the, dis in the in the in the presentation as well as in the discussion no doubt so um hope to uh, see comrades next week and uh, the weeks after that thank you very much mike and uh, see you all next week good night <laughs>